that's just an awesome example of uh, educational leadership, and we heard a lot about that yesterday. Uh, Dr. Murray, Chancellor, uh, I'd like you to come forward, please. And present. Um, like uh, Mrs. West, I'm greatly condensing uh, what I'd like to tell you this morning. I'd like to have about an hour and a half to tell you what we're doing <laughs> at Phillips Community College, but I've got 15 minutes. And as she put her her uh, phone there, her clock there on the uh, lectern, I was reminded of the small boy in church who noticed that their preacher um, would always put his watch on the pulpit when he began preaching. And he asked the, the boy asked his father one day, uh, Dad, what what does that mean? And his father said, absolutely nothing. <laughs> so I'm going to take my watch off and I'm going to put it right here. I'm not sure it means anything, but she's the gong. So I've got backup. <laughs> yeah. oh, good, good. You can drag me okay. kicking and screaming right. away from the, the mic. Um, I, I'm really pleased to be here today. Um, Phillips Community College is a part of the UA system, and there are two universities in the UA system with whom, for, for whom I feel a great deal of affinity, uh, and that is UALR and UAPB. Uh, I think in many ways your mission is very similar to the mission of Phillips Community College. I'm always telling people that uh, the Apostle Paul wrote the first community college mission statement. Most of you probably didn't know that, but he, he, he did. It was in his letter to the, the Christians in Rome when he told them to don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That's the first community college mission statement. And I tell our employees that, the, that that's our mission, that our message to uh, the students that we serve is that you don't have to conform to the world in which you find yourself. You don't have to conform to a world of poverty. You don't have to conform to a world of low expectations. You don't have to conform to a world of, of racism, to a world of addiction. You can be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And, and our job is to help in that, in that uh, transformation. Uh, we began um, about five years ago talking about uh, what we described as the things that matter. Uh, I had I was uh, the chair for uh, a small no of the board for a small nonprofit, and the director gave me a copy of uh, Ruby Payne's Bridges Out of Poverty. And I was my wife uh, was in the hospital; uh, she couldn't get a private room. She was sharing the room with a, another family, a woman who who thought she was having a heart attack. Um, uh, they were on the other side of the curtain. I was reading uh, Bridges Out of Poverty. Uh, they all had their cell phones, were talking with one another, entertaining one another, about seven or eight kids. They go out to uh, for McDonald's at two o'clock in the morning and they bring it back. I'm reading Bridges Out of Poverty and I'm thinking that this is what I'm experiencing. You know, th I, I'm, I'm seeing these living uh, examples. Uh, so I took the book the next day back to college. I, I showed it to a couple of our administrators and I said, we need to do something with this book. Uh, absolutely nothing happened. Um, it was like a rock that, you know, you had that experience. Uh, I, I know that. Um, and then we had some, some uh, of our faculty who were a part of, of the uh, uh, Pathways, the Career Pathways program uh, that had been involved in some professional development and had been exposed to the Bridges Out of Poverty concept. And our, our Career Pathways director showed up with the book and said, you know, we really ought to do something with this. And I said, that's a great idea. I wish it had been my idea. And <laughs> they took it and they ran with it. Uh, and this is what we did. We bought every college employee a copy of uh, Bridges Out of Poverty. We used some Carl Perkins money and some Achieving the Dream money. We bought every college employee from me down to the, to, to the cu custodians. Uh, we bought every college employee a copy of Bridges Out of Poverty. And we spent a year with monthly discussions about Bridges Out of Poverty. Uh, breakfast discussions, lunch, there were, there's always food involved when, when we uh, meet. We brought uh, Philip Duvall in in the spring for a day long in service uh, around Bridges Out of Poverty. We provided every employee with a copy of the workshop that was related to that. Uh, and we began to look at how we respond to students who are the product of generational poverty. Um, 
And, and this is what I think we, we learned. Um, we learned that we can't change the characteristics of our students, but we can change the way we respond to our students. And for me, the aha moment was a conversation we were having in which an instructor mentioned a student that she had who was, was late for class most of the time uh, and was going, she was going to drop that student from class because she couldn't show up for that eight o'clock class on time. And another instructor said, well, I know something about the student's circumstances. She's a single parent. She has a couple of small children. This is what her morning looks like. She, she gets those kids up. She gets them ready. She puts them in the stroller. She, she goes about eight blocks down to the daycare center. She leaves them at the daycare center. She walks back to her house and then about five blocks back that, but past that, she catches the city link uh, van. If you pay a buck, you could ride the van. It was, it, it was notorious for not being where it was supposed to, when it was supposed to be. But she would take, catch the CityLink van to the college, and if everything worked out okay, she could make it uh, to her class at eight o'clock. But her morning was a house of cards, and most morning everything didn't make it okay, and most of the time she couldn't make it by eight o'clock. Um, in the past, we would have spent a lot of time criticizing her ability, but we had decided we weren't going to do that. We were going to look at our response, and we began to realize that that was a, a, an advising issue, that if an advisor knows something about that student, that advisor is not going to put that student in an 8 o'clock class where chances of being successful are very slim. She's going to schedule her for a 9 o'clock class or an 11 o'clock class or whatever. And we also said, well, maybe we need to begin look at our, looking at our attendance policies. Uh, this instructor had the policy that every two times you were absent, you were late and you were dropped from class. So maybe we ought to start looking at that. So we learned we couldn't change the characteristics of, of our students, but we could change how we respond to those characteristics. We also learned that most of our faculty don't understand most of our students. Most of our faculty, even, even if they grew up relatively poor, and I think I did, and I was the first member of my family to attend college, even if we grew up poor, it, we weren't the product of generational poverty. So we decided that most of our faculty didn't understand most of our students and we needed to spend some time uh, coming to a better understanding of our, our students. We, we learned that students who grow up in generational poverty uh, don't lack skills, they simply lack the skills that they need to uh, succeed in, in the college and, and in the workplace. Uh, so we, we set about to, to help them develop those skills. We spent some time talking about those, those hidden rules. We also learned that we needed to be uh, more directive. Uh, we we um, decided if students don't make good choices, uh, it's irresponsible on our part to keep allowing them to make that bad choice. So we are, are intentionally being much more directed. For example, we discovered with, some, with a survey that, that most of our students think that advising is important, but they don't see their advisors. <laughs> we, we give them that choice to see their advisor or not see their advisor. So we tried to figure out how could we eliminate the choice. And we decided that we would tie it to something that they always do. They always pick up their Pell Grant refund check. And we have two disbursements. So we said, you can't pick up your Pell Grant refund check unless you go to the advisor, you see the advisor, you get a signed, dated student success pass. And when you show up with that student success pass, we give you the check. If you don't have the pass, we send you to your advisor. That means now every student sees an advisor during registration, but 80% of our students are, are receive the Pell Grant, so 80% of our students see their advisors at least three times a year. They now, the first week of the class, track their semester, track their advisors down <laughs> to make sure they made that appointment to see their, their advisor. Um, we also learned that student success doesn't 
occur in the context of a vacuum. Uh, it occurs within the context of family and community. So if we want to help students succeed, we ha as a college have to be engaged with, with the, in the lives of our students. We have to address not just academic issues, but family issues. We have to address not just uh, individual issues, but, but, but community issues. We, we have to address all of the obstacles to success, uh, not just those academic obstacles. So we've created this Center for Working Families that, that helps us address those issues. We've changed our uh, typical student orientation class to a student success class where we, uh, uh, we, we teach a, a wide range of of issues. For example, we have a, a financial literacy component um, in that student success class. We had a, a book called Becoming a Masterful Student, and I argued that we, we uh, b becoming a master student, I argued that our goal was not to help them become a master student. Our goal was to help them to become a masterful person. So we have broadened that course, made it a student success course, and we're addressing a whole range of obstacle, obstacles to success. We, we wanted, again, to make it mandatory, so what we did, did was to break it into two components. Uh, almost all of our students have to take uh, a developmental writing course, and then almost all of them have to take freshman English, so we tied half of the student success course to each of those two courses so that almost all of our students end up not having the choice to not take the student success course. Uh, we also learned that we have to be community developers. We're a good community college in a declining community. Uh, we cannot remain forever a good community college in a declining community. So we have begun in, engaging our community around economic uh, development issues. We've created a business incubator to address those issues. I want to go just a little bit beyond Bridges Out of Poverty to what we did the second year. We spent the first year talking about class and how we as an institution respond to uh, uh, students who are the product of generational poverty. But the issue of class in this country is also intertwined with the issue of race. Uh, they're not the same, but they're intertwined. And yes, there are a lot of poor white people in Arkansas, but the reality is that if you're poor and black, it's much di more difficult to crawl, to climb out of the hole of poverty than if you're poor and white. The two issues are intertwined. So we got brave and decided the second year we would take the same approach to talking about issues of race. We bought every college employee a copy of Nathan McCall's book, Them. Uh, you probably heard of Nathan McCall, uh, uh, a couple of decades ago when he wrote his, his autobiography, Makes Me Want to Holler. But Them was his first novel. In the context of that novel, if you're white, them are black. If you're black, them are white. Uh, we bought every college employee a copy of Them. We went through the same uh, year-long process of having frequent conversations around uh, that book, Them. We, we learned a number of things. We learned that it's easier to discuss them than it is us. The book was a very good vehicle. The book was a very good vehicle for discussing issues of race because we could start out talking about characters and then end up talking about our character. Um, we also learned that we can acknowledge the bear in the corner and survive. You know, for us, race had always been the issue that was over there in the periphery, but we ignored it. Uh, race, racism is the only social problem that we think is best solved by ignoring. Every other social problem that you can think of, we think that the best way to address that problem is to get it out in the open and talk about it. But with racism, we think the best way to address that problem is to don't talk about it, ignore it. Well, we, we discovered, go ahead. <laughs> I never want to erupt a good round of applause, interrupt a good round of applause. We also learned that we're not as colorblind as we pretend to be. As a community college, we 
valued ourselves, we value ourselves on being democratic, on being egalitarian. And Phillips Community College is the most integrated institution in, in our, our county. It's the only institution that is remotely uh, integrated. For many of our students, it's the first time they've ever, their, their first class at Phillips Community College is the first time they've ever attended a class with a significant number of people of a different race. Um, that, that, that is in many ways tragic, but it is, it is the, the truth. Uh, so we took pride on being above that issue, on being colorblind. We, we learned that we're not as colorblind as we pretend to be, and we probably shouldn't um, pretend that we are, that being colorblind probably shouldn't be our goal, that our goal ought not to be just to tolerate our differences, that our goal ought to become uh, to, to treasure our differences, to appreciate our, our differences. Um, we also um, learned that we're a more inviting college to, to Barlow than we are Tyrone. Barlow was an a, a, a African American man with a job in his mid-30s in the novel. Um, we decided we were pretty engaging. We were inviting to bar the Barlows of our community. Tyrone was the young 18-year-old, uh, 19-year-old African-American male with the saggy britches and the hip-hop culture, uh, you know, the what's up dog language. Yeah. Um, You're so very good at it. I am. Boy, I, I had that down, you know. We can raise the roof or something in a minute. But, um, you know, we, we decided that we weren't as engaging to, to um, uh, the Tyrones who came through our door and that we needed to become more engaging, that it wasn't Tyrone's issue, it was m my issue to a large extent. So we've been involved in some conversations with Kareem M Moody and we're working on developing, who you're going to hear from later, and I'm glad I'm not following him, <laughs> uh, you, we're going to begin working on a minority male initiative so that we can become more engaging to the, the Tyrones who walk through our door. We also learned that you don't resolve issues of race by, by giving everybody a book and talking about it. Uh, when we had Nathan McCall on campus for the, a, a workshop in the spring, wonderful experience. It was supposed to be an hour and a half long. It ran close to three hours long. At the end of it, I told our employees that I'd never been more proud of, of being the chancellor of Phillips Community College. It was an absolutely wonderful, compelling conversation. We asked hard questions. He gave us thoughtful responses. I was on cloud nine when we left. We always have everyone complete a survey evaluating the end service. About 85% of us, they were on cloud nine too. About 15% said white privilege. There's not anything, you know, there's no such thing as white privilege. And why are you talking about race? You don't, you just need to just not stir that up, leave it alone. So we discovered you know, we'd started some important work, but we had a lot more work to do. What we've done this year, we tried to keep the focus on, on poverty. We had uh, the folks from AD, ADHE do a poverty simulation workshop. But we've also had four Clinton School students working on, working with us to develop a curriculum for uh, a, a grassroots, small group, dialogue to action approach to conversations about race. It's very similar to what Memphis is doing with the Common, its Common Grounds initiative. Uh, we've developed this year the curriculum. We pilot tested it this fall. We're going to use it with our, with our uh, faculty and our staff. Uh, next spring, we're going to use the, the curriculum and have the conversations with our students. Then the fall, the next fall, we're going to uh, be really brave and, and take it to the community and try to have those conversations within our community. Uh, when, when you hear an explosion, you know, a year from now, it's, it's blowing up in my face. But, you know, my theory is I'm, I'm 60, I'll be 61 in November. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at working five or six more years. If the thing blows up in my face, early retirement's not a bad thing. And you might as well go out with a bang. Um, I'm sure I've used my time. 
Wow, we've had some really great responses to uh, what we learned yesterday as well and listened to some practitioners who are making a huge difference. Yeah. Very impressive. Um, our last presentation then will be from Ms. Dovey Burrell and um, I'll let you go ahead and, and introduce the best you know with. Good morning. Good morning. When I think about Branch Normal, AMN, now the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, I'm reminded of our mission to serve those that were underprivileged and who were, were less fortunate um, than some to go to institutions uh, outside of the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff. Bridges out of poverty, and poverty has been defined in many ways today, um, certainly reminds us that it is so incumbent upon us as educators to um, remember and realize we are still serving those students today. And I am so honored to have the opportunity to introduce to you a student who is with us on our campus uh, today that will share her story, uh, who her future story, mm -hmm. one who came out of uh, poverty and she has a story to tell. And uh, you'll see it on the clip in just a second. And um, I met this young lady as a freshman and I was asked to mentor her. And it was very, very, very difficult because I had never met a student of her stat status and I really wasn't sure how to uh, work with her in reference to some of the needs that she had. But what I did do was I began to travel to those places where students uh, came from outside of the state of Arkansas and in the urban communities so that I could better know how to serve those students. Uh, not just myself, but there are others who work along with us and we created an organization called OLOT that stands for One Life at a Time. That organization on our campus today um, helps to serve those students that are underprivileged and to help provide an aid and benevolence for the simple things such as quarters to wash clothes. It makes a difference in whether or not they'll go to class. So I want to, uh, without further delay, share this with you and then I will um, end by letting you know how the relationship between the two of us has come to full fruition. I'm from Chicago, Illinois, and I grew up in a low-income apartment area complex called the Denver Home, and that would be considered a project. So I'm actually from the ghetto of Chicago, Illinois. Um, I stayed in building 2971 for maybe um, a roughly 10 years. In my own words, I would say to have to go without, to have to just not have, to want and know you can't have it, to want more for yourself but there's no way you can get it because everything around you is telling you that it's okay to not have it or wants you to settle because they're comfortable with living the way they live or poverty is to me um, a lot of things I must get into survival mode and block all those around me out that is not, uh, I wouldn't say a benefit, but that is not positive to my, to my growth. So I would just isolate myself from anyone around me and just continue on because I know I have to do what I need to do. I was actually once told that my children would never have to live the way I have, that I had to live growing up. So my motivation would be a change for my own children if I was having, I'm not even sure, but you know, a different life, like I didn't want to settle. It wasn't difficult, um, I must say. Uh, I kind of agree with the, you can become a product of your environment, but only to a certain extent. Um, I lived around gangbangers, 
uh, drug dealers, uh, spice, everything like, you know, everything you could possibly think of. I have witnessed uh, drive-by shootings, um, uh, drug transactions, uh, police brutality. <laughs> Uh, it's not funny. I don't mean to laugh. It's just uh, so it was. It wasn't hard living there because I was from there. So I would actually say there wasn't a problem because when if that's all you know, then you're fine. You'll become fine with it. You'll grow to adapt to it and be accustomed to the way things go around. around. So I actually started school at seven years old, and everyone knows that's not the normal age to start school at. Uh, I didn't attend preschool or kindergarten or any of that. Um, I started at seven, and I started first grade at seven years old. I attended Daniel Hill Williams Elementary School all the way up to eighth grade. I kind of think that uh, was a bit of a struggle due to the fact that I didn't have the uh, proper training for it first grade, like I was just pushed into it. But I overcame, you know, certain obstacles that occurred along the way, and math really was a struggle for me, I guess because I just feared it the whole time, or not, I don't, I don't really know, but uh, I guess the late start of education, I would say that, but most people wouldn't even probably consider that a late start, because I still, I didn't, uh, have to repeat any classes. Knowing that I have had an opportunity to do some of the things that I never thought I would be able to do, like the whole attending the university was a big step for me. So the fact that I'm, I'll be soon graduating with a degree in criminal justice, and I was told that I wouldn't be able to do do it because I was from a project or a ghetto or whatever and you know my mother was a crackhead or my father was a crackhead or something you know like I wasn't supposed to have this opportunity but I had it so when I think about the fact that I will soon be done with a degree that no one ever thought I would get it makes me smile. <laughs> strong-minded as me, I must say, so if you have to have that, and if you don't, they'll kind of like throw you all off track. So I would probably say that the fact that I know that my little sister may not have this, may not have the opportunities I have because she's so off, gone off into her own world or something, or like, if she's too old for me to even say a word to her that'll reach her because she thinks she's so grown or something like <laughs> Or maybe the fact that most black women do settle or once you are told that you can't do something, you won't even try because you already been told by a hundred people that you can't do it. But if only just one would tell a person then maybe they, they would at least, you know, It would be myself <laughs> and those around me that have been by my side through it all. Like, I, I have had to make family. Like, I'm really not close with my family per se, but I have met people along the way that have stuck with me through my journey. So when I just feel like I can't do it or something, I just think about those people that have been at my side along the way, that have stuck with me, that do believe in me, that, you know, that wants me to make it. I try to block all the negativity out because it's, it constantly comes directly at me, but I tend to not let that interfere with what I have going on. Um, I envision my future to be great. Um, I have been prepared and installed with the necessities that will help me along the way in life. Like, I now know that uh, there's a world beyond the project. 
Does, does that make sense? Like, I now know that. I, I didn't know that at first. I know that there is a future for the earth. But complete college with a degree in criminal justice. I would like to become a juvenile probation officer. Um, I will continue to go to school after, um, but I would like to work first. You know, um, I want to help juveniles. I want to reach juveniles. I have um, been around people all my life that just didn't have any guidance. Even though a person would probably say, by the time a, a juvenile reached me, it would be considered too late. But I want to I want to let them know it's not like it's okay. Society tells you that it's too late, but I just want to put my little part in it and let you know that it's not. Coming here, upon coming here to UAPB, um, I was introduced to a Miss Debbie Burrow. And she was actually um, a fan of my mentor. Um, she accepted the position as my mentor, and she has really been a, a big help in my whole journey. Like, um, I, le I actually left school for maybe like a year and a half and came back, and I just wanted, I called her. I actually called her, and I was like, uh, well, Ms. Burrow, um, you know, things wasn't working out. I just knew I, I knew I needed to be back in school. So I just let her know that um, I was really ready this time and that I really wanted to finish, but I needed to know would I have someone there to help me along the way? Because, you know, help without, you know, everyone needs someone. And she was able to let me know that she would be there for me whenever I needed, if I was serious about returning and finishing. And everything has worked out extremely good this time around. Like I'm, <laughs> I really, I'm really enjoying school. I'm so happy I came back. Um, I'm ready to be finished, and I just want to thank her. Thank you, Miss W. Burrow, for you know the pushing, the encouragement. Uh, she took a chance on me when everyone else turned their backs on me. Uh, <laughs> She has defended me in so much stuff. Like she, she knows the person that everyone wants to know. Or she has brought the person out that everyone wants to know. And I just thank her for that. Ladies and gentlemen, can I please introduce you to Miss Shaquita Phillips? I'm going to ask her if she would come to the stage at this time. <laughs> this is Shaquita. Um, hello. <laughs> and um, some of you may have questions. We have a presentation for her. But I am very, very, very proud of her. And I want to say that um, she came in 2005 with a group of about 40. I want to give you the stats on those 40 students that came. They were all a part of the OLOT program. And um, I, I would be remiss if I did not uh, introduce Mr. Michael Washington to some and present him to others mm -hmm. as my cohort and partner with the founding of OLOT. Um, and I'd like for him to stand just for a moment. Of those 40 students, we have uh, six that have graduated, nine that are presently on our campus, 15 that left because the transition was very, very difficult, and they returned home. They're not in school, but they returned home. We had three that were uh, suspended, expelled, uh, because the transition of um, moving to a, a, an academic setting was very, very, very difficult for them. Um, we have had uh, one that was killed, tragically, mm -hmm. and there are six that still live in the city of Pine Bluff. They're not in school, but they have found their places and made Pine Bluff their homes. So. Mm -hmm. 
Dr. Johnson is going to present something to her. Ms. Phillips, on, on behalf of the Mary e. Benjamin Conference on Educational Access Planning Committee in the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff, it is my pleasure to present to you this token of our appreciation Thank to you. you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions before she takes her seat? Anyone? Mm -hmm. Dr. Are you um, I'm trying to graduate in December. <laughs> in December? Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so that is the end to the panel discussion. Let's give them another round of applause. I, I'm sure as you were listening, you, your mind was running through different things and as you t heard, as we heard about the the hidden rules and the plain talk about poverty, um, there are a lot of hidden rules, and and we just need to be reminded about about those kinds of things. Um, we need to be able to see the world through the eyes of others. It helps us to know why and understand things that they must must do. Um, you know, I think it was. Uh, Will Rogers, Dr. Hurst, that said it's never too late to do good. If he didn't say it, it sounded like something he should have said. <laughs> now, one of the things that, uh, and I need to do some good here, one of the things that I, uh, it was an oversight and I forgot and uh, to my student teachers that are here, you should never forget to recognize your leaders uh, when you go into a meeting, and I did that this morning. So at this time, and I know Dr. Benjamin and Chancellor Davis very seldom get a chance to sit in the audience, and that's where they are this morning. So at this time, I want to present our Chancellor, Chancellor Davis. And to our Vice Chancellor and founder of this great conference, Dr. Mary E. Benjamin. I have some uh, presentations that I need to make um, very briefly here. I will, I will just start in the order that I'm finding them here listed on these boxes. So the very first one has Dr. Uh, Andrew Stewart's name on it. Dr. Stewart, would you come forward, please? And they all read the same, the 18th Annual Mary Benjamin Conference on Educational Access. Thank you. That was a big one. Dr. Murray, Dr. Stephen Murray. Thank you so very much for being here with us this morning. Appreciate your comments. Ms. West. Ms. West, I think we're going to have to adopt you. You were oh. here yesterday. Thank you so much for my, being here. My great pleasure. All right. Thank you. Ms. Broadway. Ms. Broadway. Ms. Broadway. Ms. Broadway. Thank you so much. 